Hi, Dominique, uh, and uh, welcome again to a uh, week ahead, another edition of Week Ahead. So as most of the weeks this year have been, it's certainly uh, incredibly uh, exciting, confusing, probably at times, uh, although you've definitely been ahead of the curve and feels like the, the world's kind of moving to your, your view of the world. It's, uh, it's interesting, I'll just very quick anecdote that uh, Bilal and I went to see uh, a big bank this week in person, which is nice to be able to see people in person. And a lot of people are pretty confused about the, some of the price actions in, in markets, whether it's the dollar or even kind of interest rates. Um, so first, I guess, just you know, any big takes from, from last week? So, um... Yeah, I mean, the difficulty with the price action is that it reflects a lot of things putting it, pushing in opposite uh, direction. So, I mean, my take is that, you know, if you look at uh, inflation expectations, they are falling. If you look at uh, uh, expectation of uh, Fed tightening, it's consolidating or falling a little bit. And uh, at the same time, you have this, you know, really nasty moves uh, in uh, in equity markets, a bit of stabilization of yield. So what I think is going on here is that the market uh, is thinking that basically there is a recession coming and that the recession is going to do part of the job of the Fed uh, in bringing down inflation. Uh, and my take is different. Um, I think what is going on is that the economy is slowing back to trend, which you know sh should happen because the pandemic is behind us. Um, but that slowdown, in my view, is not going to be enough uh, to allow the Fed to stick with its uh, plan of uh, raising the Fed funds to 2.8 percent, uh, and you know we're done. Um, I just don't believe it's going to happen. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I just had this discussion with a few people, uh, more kind of real estate people. And, you know, a lot, of, a lot of people, let's say more finance, real estate people, you know, have this view that the stock market sells off 15, 20%. And, you know, the, back to the playbook we've seen the last kind of 15, 20 years, and that kind of freaks out the, um, uh, the Fed. But do you want to just touch on your, your view one more time, which I think is very interesting of why you think um, if there is a point we're very far away from it because of the disconnect of what the real economy and, and, um, and the relationship to, to the stock market? Oh, totally. So first of all, let's look at things from the perspective of the Fed, because after all, they are the one making the decisions, not us. So no questions, there was some time ago a Fed put. But the reason there was a Fed put was not because the Fed liked the market. It's just because the Fed was trying to push inflation towards its target, which it couldn't do because uh, the reasons for low inflation were structural. Uh, and at the same time, so inflation was permanently low. Uh, the Fed believed that monetary policy got transmitted through a tightening, through changes in financial conditions. So when inflation was underperforming, uh, uh, the Fed was pumping plenty of stimulus in the economy, which was going to uh, Wall Street instead of uh, mainstream. Uh, because uh, because of the small wealth effect. Uh, basically, and I, I hope people had a chance to look at my, my weekly a week ago, uh, if you look at the relationship between uh, wealth uh, and consumption, so once upon, so two things have happened. First of all, the distribution of wealth is so skewed uh, that it's highly concentrated uh, with, a, you know, highly concentrated with the top uh, income Americans, uh, and then the, if you look at the composition of wealth for the average uh, household, the share of stocks and bonds is the same as the share of uh, bonds uh, of, of real estate. So what you've had is that the appreciation of the 
uh, house, of housing values, it's still going down, Buster. We're talking about 15 to 20% a year. That's completely offset uh, for the average American. Uh, the, uh, the, the fall in, uh, in the value of bonds and stock. So the right. impact of uh, Fed, you know, of uh, the so-called tightening of uh, financial condition on consumption is very, is very, is very small. Yeah. So basically, average person in America is going to have to start seeing um, either questions about their job security or their house price, house prices starting to fall to really kind of psychologically feel an impact of uh, reduced basically spending or consumption. Uh, totally. And more the job prospect uh, than the wealth, because the other thing that's happened since uh, the GFC is that uh, the savings rate is no longer responsive to uh, wealth. Before the GFC, there was a really nice relationship from my perspective as an economist. I always like it when you have clear trend, you could really see a negative relationship between savings rate and wealth. But since the crisis, the relationship has, uh, has completely broken down. So the Fed could keep going, you know, uh, because as um, um, George, you know, the Per Maho on the committee reminded us yesterday, they don't care about asset value. They would only care if, you know, the change of regime towards much higher interest rate uh, uncovered some hidden weakness that had systemic implications. But what we've seen so far, however painful it is for the people who are directly involved, it's not having systemic right. consequences. And, and just for the record, the chance that there is with how low interest rates have been and how much money is floating in the system, although that maybe that may cover it over. I'm sure there are some massive um, over levered imbalances that have been created in the last kind of five, 10 years that may come out. Oh, no right question. Now, our goal is, we don't see it. We're not there to predict that. Um, no, no question. And I think we're going to see them once QT starts for real. So next month, yeah. over the summer, because the one thing that people don't realize about QE and QT is that it does not work uh, through the uh, portfolio balance effect. I mean, the Fed loves to talk about that because they are all PhD economics and being able to derive the model of the portfolio balance effect is what you need to do in order to get your PhD. But the reality, <laughs> if, you look at the, if you look at the data, the yeah. reality is the biggest impact uh, of QE and so of QT has been on money growth. Because what happens is that the Fed has been transacting uh, for QT and QE with uh, non-banks. And the way it works is that when you transact with them, you, cr you create deposit. When, because basically the, the Fed gives cash to people for uh, bonds. So they have to, part, to, keep, to put the cash in the banking system. That, this is the last time that, that they finished. worked with BlackRock? Was it like, is that what it was? Well, so um, they did some work with BlackRock to determine what bonds to buy, which you know, shows you the extent of madness and overextension of the monetary policy. But even before we get there, so when you buy, when the Fed buys a bond from a bank, nothing happens to the quantity of money, right? The deposits, the liability side of the balance sheet of the bank is unchanged, but the, the asset side changes. They have a fewer bonds, more cash. But when the Fed buys a bond from someone who is not a bank, in effect, they are liquefying their, their assets. They get, they lose bonds and they get bank deposits money. And I don't think there is enough awareness of that. And I think that's one of the channels through which uh, QE has really boosted asset values. And now, and by the way, the data, show, the data shows it. I hope people will you know, uh, click on my, uh, on my weekly about the velocity of money, but it, it's clearly shown by the data. So now you are going to, much, to have much slower uh, growth in uh, bond money, and that is going to be painful. Yeah. Yeah, the combination does not seem great. So, so um, the week ahead, what should people be look at, looking out for? Um, oh, okay, so... And, and are you, the fact that 
rates of yields have come off in the U.S. You know, twenty basis points in the last kind of week or two. Uh, what 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 sh- does that make you question anything, or do you think it's makes sense in the long end? It doesn't make sense in the middle and the front end. You know. So uh, I'm always, you know, questioning everything I write because otherwise, I, if I start believing uh-huh. in my own stories, I will get killed. Um, but no, because to me, you know, it's it uh, what we are seeing. I mean, to me, it's about the big picture, and the big picture is we've had the biggest uh, global supply shock since the 1970s, and the biggest positive demand shock. Uh, since World War II. I mean, the fiscal policy in America has been insane. And there is no way uh, this has not generated persistent inflation. I think what we are seeing is that a a sort of a lull because global supply chains were improving before the the invasion of Ukraine, before China got into new uh, COVID issues. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, but, and also the U.S. economy is getting a second wind from consumer borrowing. So to me, it's a sort of a lull in the data, and I don't expect it to last. Right. Okay. All right. And then the key stuff for the week ahead, what do you think? So uh, the minutes, of course. So we're going to get the usual, you know, the minutes. It's almost a ritual exercise, you know. Uh, on the one hand, on the other hand, monetary policy outlook, economic outlook, um, you know, the u- usual stuff. But what we should really be looking for is uh, MBS uh, sales, because with the mortgage rates at, you know, the first year mo- uh, rate is at uh, 5.25 people are not going to refinance. So the redemptions of MBS are going to fall well below the cap, uh, which is 17 and a half billion a month for three months starting in June, and then 35 billion. So it's only a matter of time uh, for the Fed to start you know, outright sales, which by the way, are not that different from using cap, but, uh, they like to announce policy changes, you know, well ahead of time. Uh, so I think we could get a hint uh, that okay. outright MBS sales are coming. And is that market moving or it's more of a long-term impact type thing? Um, it, it, the Fed is certainly hoping that it's market moving uh, because they need the, um, the real estate market to uh, cool off. And I think, yeah, I mean, short Okay, term, so yeah. they're hoping for, at a minimum, the spread widening between mortgages and treasuries. Exactly, fine, exactly. Fine, fine. And then uh, quickly, any, um, any big speakers, any specific data coming out? Um, so in the data, we have the usual, you know, at this time of month, uh, PCE, where I think the consensus Forecast for 30 basis points seems a, a bit low. Uh, personal spending and income, where I'm looking for a further decline in the savings rate. Um, we are also getting uh, the second estimate of the Q1 uh, GDP, uh, where um, I'll be very interested in CapEx because we had a, a big CapEx number. And this typically happens when there is resource pressure uh, basically, companies are running out of room to produce more. So uh, I'll be looking at the revisions to that. Uh, then there is uh, retail inventories. There was a, a bit of an increase in, uh, uh, in retail inventories relative to sales outside of uh, cars, which could explain you know, the pessimism about the economy, the recession. Right. And but all this focus very... on like Target and, and Walmart, yeah. I guess Costco yeah. maybe, I don't know if they, yeah. um, so is, is that inventory is going to be an important number or that's like? Um, I'll be looking at it because um, it's very volatile number. Fine. Um, I, I think it's really temporary, uh, certainly with all the logistics uh, difficulties. Uh, you know, the real-time inventory management has come under stress. 
Um, so, but it's more likely to reflect supply issues and a, supr a su surprise decline in demand. Yeah. I mean, if you look at retail sales, uh, you know, right. Americans I'm, are still shopping. Yeah, beside them still shopping, they're clearly the service businesses are still running and manufacturing. You know, I'm looking at these numbers. Like if, if you hadn't looked at anything, you just saw how the markets have behaved over the last kind of two or three weeks. So is, forget about equities, even just bonds. You know, uh, U.S. manufacturing, PMI, 57.9 expected. Services PMI, 55.2. I mean, the way the markets are reacting is like the world's coming to an end and the economy's falling off a cliff, which a lot of people have been now predicting. But these numbers are still pretty strong. I mean, obviously, the, things could change quickly, but... I think you're, you're spot on, Andrew, because of the pandemic and this crazy, crazy policy response we've had, hyper stimulus, uh, the economy went gangbusters and now it's normalizing. And I think people are overreacting. But it's still, I mean, I'm saying like these yeah. numbers are still pretty strong. <laughs> of course. Of course they are. It's, it's amazing to me. Okay, cool. Um, anything else quick? I mean, like, uh, if you are interested in U.S. politics, uh, my favorite uh, little topic. So we've had a round of uh, primaries and surprise, surprise, the Pennsylvania primaries that we were talking about last week. Guess what? It's still undecided because the difference between the Trump backed candidate and the hedge fund guy, my former boss. Who also Andy likes Cooper. Trump, but he just wasn't backed by Trump. or something. Yeah. Well, I mean, Trump likes to back winners. Uh, so it's so tiny. Uh, it's not sure who's who's won. But in general, I'd say Trump back candidates did okay, but yeah. they didn't, didn't win. They didn't do amazing. Yeah. Yeah. My, I, from what I read, the, the governor race is the important one. You know, if Pennsylvania is such an important state. Yeah. And anyway. Um, and and so the Democrat picked a candidate who had a stroke on the campaign trail. So we better. Of hope. course, he's good. <laughs> he's it's horrible to say, but like, as Bill Maher likes to say, you know, they're just shooting them in the cells in the foot constantly. But well, uh, I mean, we never know. He could turn vegan between now and the election, and you know, show up uh, slimmer, fitter. Exactly. And, you know anything I mean? is possible. This yes. is America. Hey. Yes. Um, before people leave, I was going to just look at something for one second. Just this thing around oil. Keep the likes of any of this. Um, so this is, it's not a big deal, but this is just looking at July um, volatility around the July oil future. Um, as we've talked about in the past, you know, oil is pretty strong and obviously very important. Everyone talks about super tight um, uh, inventories uh, <clears throat> and massive underinvestment over the last couple of years, all of this coming to roost. And, and also, you know, it's the short end, particularly, uh, you know, immediate supply issues, um, which are most acute. So the, the oil curve, the futures curve, prices are higher in the front, and they go down as um, further out in the futures curve. By the way, I or we think there's some interesting kind of carry trades there still, and buying kind of December or January futures. But what I wanted to show people is, this is looking at the vol curve for July on April 28th, which is in the red, um, versus um, 20th of May, uh, which is in the white. And what this shows is, despite people worried about a much, you know, a big move in oil up to $150, as people say, and the inflational impact is even the energy market over the last couple of weeks has been overwhelmed by this question about global growth. And by the way, there's a lot of other factors, like we said, specifically around supply issues, um, energy transition, other things of why even if growth slowed, oil can, can continue to go significantly higher. And we've seen that many times in the past. But when you think about volatility, it's interesting that this is how much vols have moved since then. Upside uh, volatility, so people concerned about a much more volatile move to the upside has fallen significantly and people are more becoming much more concerned about a move down. Now, this could just be another, my 
view, and I think probably fits in with Dominique's narrative that this would be just another example of the market very short term, probably getting overly excited about uh, a real drop off in, in global growth. And in reality, oil and many other things are still quite strong. And this just like probably uh, yield, certainly in the short end and, and middle part of the curve, uh, most likely will continue higher, uh, especially as the Fed continues to, to be committed to, to um, bringing inflation down and higher, higher yield, but also the fact that growth is not falling off a cliff, not from what we see right now. So I would leave that with everyone. I wish everyone a, a wonderful rest of the, the, well, this would be weekend for us, but a lot of people get this on Sunday. So have a great week. As always, we'd love to get all the feedback, everything, um, anything we can do better, challenging our views. And Dominique, I don't know, any last words or? Uh, good luck, everybody, and uh, reach out. Awesome. Okay, cool. Thanks. Bye. Bye. Bye.